You know, Florida has many ways to relax. And one of the best ways to do that is to hit up one of Florida's state forests. So we're here today at the Florida Forest Services, and they're gonna take us to some of these state forests and show us how they manage these lands. So sit back, relax, and join me on this Science Quest. I'm here with Corey Walk. He is the Forestry Resource Administrator for the Florida Forest Service. Corey, we're out here, we see a bunch of burn stuff here. When you drive in past the road, we see this all the time here in Florida. You look to the right, you look to the left. Oh my gosh, there must have been a fire there. Look at everything burnt. But you guys actually do this on purpose, don't you? Right. We, we burn our uh, natural communities here on Lake Wells Ridge State Forest for multiple reasons. Um, Main reason is to reduce the risk of wildfires on the state forest, as well as for other ecological reasons being uh, animals that are maybe threatened and endangered that live here within the forest, as well as plant species that live within our forest as well. That the fire, uh, they're fire adapted natural communities and they depend on fire, okay. which is why we, the number one reason why we burn here. All right. the, the main purpose is to reduce the fuels that are here um, mainly the palmetto, mm -hmm. uh, the oak height, and the other vegetation that unless we burn it, it will continue to get taller. Uh, in areas like this, behind us here, this area is habitat for Florida scrub jays, and they historically have preferred a lower height, mm -hmm. preferably less than si six feet or less, for their natural habitat, which with burning, it allows us to maintain that habitat over time. Now, the, um, this area right here, where, where are we actually at? What's we're, we're right now standing in a depression marsh. Um, we're also on the edge of some um, scrub as well as some scrubby flatwood sites. Okay. Now, that's, that's something that's unique with Florida. We have so many different types of, of landscapes here. I mean, how, how do you manage working within all these different types of ecosystems? Um, we work closely with uh, staff on the state forest as well as we work with other agency professionals which includes Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission biologists uh, for management of species that are located on the forest as well as um, through our uh, management plan planning mm -hmm. uh, with the state office in Tallahassee for planning for management within these, these ecosystems okay. that exist here. So Corey, a lot of what you guys do, people don't really notice. It's in the it's in the background, but this is a full time this is a full time job by really qualified professionals, isn't it? Yeah, and a lot of our staff here um, have either been here uh, a few years years or they've been here a while. Uh, so they they know the property, they know what exists, what kind of communities are here, um, as well as uh, trained staff need to be on fires to respond to wildfires as well as be a part of prescribed burns and they have to have all these qualifications that they have to have to be even beyond a burn as well as uh, other resources get measured as well like inventory and uh, in terms of what exists we have other staff that like threaten endangered plants and animals as well that are monitored. Now in the case of an unplanned fire you know obviously these types of burns are, are well controlled you have ways of, of, of making sure that they don't get out of control, but on an unplanned fire that maybe takes off, uh, obviously fire departments are called in and all kinds of stuff. What is your role when it comes to something like that? How do you guys, I mean, are you in an advisory capacity? Do you jump in there with the gear? What, how do you guys work that? We communicate internally with our local forest area supervisors if there's a wildfire, um, and then with local fire departments to respond to the emergency if it's a wildfire. Mm -hmm. Uh, if it's on the state forest, we pretty much do the same thing. If it's adjacent to private property and it's getting on their property, um, obviously 911 is involved, but the first to usually respond are our forest rangers and fire certified personnel along with tractor plows and transports that will respond to a wildfire. And we also have them on prescribed burns as well on, on scene in case there is spots or in case there is an escape 
from the actual plan fire. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm sure a wildfire is something totally different from house fires or structure fires. I mean, it's a whole nother beast. You're working with giant swaths of land, conditions of wind and all kinds of stuff. So I'm sure that, you know, having well-trained and qualified professionals is, is key to a successful operation. We talked about the ecosystems here. There's so many different types of lands in Florida and each one of those separate places has different kinds of vegetation, different kinds of growth. How do you determine what requires more focus and what doesn't? Uh, through our plant conservation program, we have a monitoring program here for listed species of plants. Uh, and we have a plant ecologist, uh, okay. biologist position here that monitors those species on site um, on all tracks here on the forest. And that's Candace Canelty. All right, let's go, let's go meet up with her. Hi, Candace. I'm with Candace Kenothi. She's the plant biologist here with the uh, Florida Forest Service. Candace, um, I just got done talking with Corey. We were talking about the areas that you know we you burn to make sure that uh, species survive and things like that. Um, one of the questions that I had was, there's so many different types, and even where we were just at looked different than where we are now. There's so many different types of ecosystems. How do you determine what kind of plants you you pay attention to? Well, we have um, a number of different rare plants and animals on the Lake Ridge State Forest. Um, we have 16 federally listed plants, 15 actually, and one listed lichen. And um, those what's a, are... What's a lichen? A lichen is an organism that's an association between an algae or a cyanobacteria and that lives within the filaments of fungi. Okay, so it has nothing to do with werewolves then? No, it's, it's right. this stuff on the ground right here. Oh, okay, yeah. very cool. Yeah. Um, well, now this is all part of a program within the Florida Forest Service, right? It's, tell me about your, uh, your preservation program. Hey, so I work for the Plant Conservation Program and that's a program that aims um, to work for the recovery of federally listed species in Florida. And the goal really is to maintain and restore existing populations of federally listed species on public and private lands that are set aside for conservation purposes. Now, you said that you had like, how many, 15, 16 different yep, species? Have... How did you determine those species? Where, where does all that come from? So, uh, botanists a long time ago and, and the work of many biologists have helped to identify these species. Many of these species are endemic uh, to Central Florida and the Lake Wells Ridge. And so a lot of them are only found two counties or five counties or seven counties. Oh, wow. So they're very restricted to this area. Now, when we talk about special types of plant biology or special species of plants, how does that also tie into the animal life that's around? Well, when we um, manage for plants here, we're really managing for the entire ecosystem. Um, managing for scrub and scrubby areas um, is kind of helping to manage for scrub jays as well. Mm -hmm. We're keeping um, the shrubs low in height to the scrub jays' right. preferred uh, requirements and also keeping um, a lot of the shrubs down for um, the plant species that occur in these scrub areas like as well. Like this little lizard, I mean, there's some special kind of lizard or something that, that is... We have sand skinks? Skink, yeah, yeah. that's it, that's it. Yeah. Um, now. When you go about your daily work, what, what is the process of managing these special species? Well, our program has a number of different things. Uh, one of the things I do is I map the rare species. So I go out and GPS the locations of these plants and we maintain a database of um, where these species occur and we have a really big database that we maintain through uh, GIS. Well, you've got a big area of land to cover too, yes. so I could imagine the database is huge. Now Candace, you're mapping rare species and all this other stuff, is that all that you do? I mean, is that the main portion of your job? No, there are a lot of other facets to the job. Um, in addition to surveying and mapping, um, I also do surveys where um, we visit plants annually or biannually to see how their populations in, um, are doing from year to year. We also do demographic projects. It's like a plant checkup. Yeah. yeah, we do demographic <laughs> projects where we um, 
We follow individual tagged plants um, from year to year. Um, we can assess their survival, their growth, um, the recruitment of individuals into that population. We can evaluate um, the, what types of positive or negative impacts our management may have on them, mm -hmm. allow us to learn a little bit more about their management needs and learn more about their biology. I also help um, develop burn plans and I also assist on, on um, prescribed burns okay. as well. Now when you say develop burn plans, so this is after you've burned, you go in and check on them or what, what's that? This is a uh, planning for the burns beforehand oh, okay. so we typically um, so you want to make sure you're not burning up things that you don't yeah, want to burn up yeah we we try to follow specific intervals for the different habitats we don't want to burn things up too uh, quickly okay yeah um, how do you determine like so Corey had mentioned something that I thought was interesting he said um, burn adapted plants how does that come into play when you're talking about you know checking up you know, and, and, and trying to figure out what plants are going to be involved in a burn. Um, I recommend certain areas to be burned um, because many of the species that I work with are dependent on those communities. So um, much of the federally listed species that we have here are found on these xeric uplands that are fire adapted. So a lot of them require um, bare open patches of sand, um, areas free of litter, um, an open canopy, all things that fire help uh, so, give us. So even though the fire is destructive for a time, the overall effect of the fire is good for the plants. It's very beneficial, yeah. yes. Very good. We're, we're right here in this scrub area and we, we had just taken a look at kind of like a scrubby area that, that when I was talking to Corey, but that's not the only places that we have around here. I mean, we've got big giant hammocks and trees. Or, do you take care of that stuff too? Yeah, I mean, overall, um, my job here is to just look out for the overall health of all these mm -hmm. ecosystems. So, yeah. yeah, it's not just defined to, um, you know, the areas where the plants occur, but just looking out for the general health of the forest. Are, are trees a special kind of, um, they're a special kind of breed as opposed to more like plant species? Yes, uh, different plants are classified as, as forbs, those Mm -hmm. little things that you would find on the ground, close to the ground. Um, there are shrubs and then we have sub canopy and then we have canopy trees. So they all have kind of different requirements mm -hmm. and strata. So are there, are there specialized people that take care of like the different areas of, of plant life, like trees or plants? Yeah, so we have a forester um, at our state forest that deals with um, our tree species and overall timber management. Excellent, well let's, let's go talk to him. What's his name? His name's Nathan Bartosik. Okay, great. Well, let's go talk to Nate and, uh, and we'll see what he has to say about the trees. Okay. After you. Hey, Nathan. Hey, how you doing? Good. I'm with Nathan Bartosik. He is the forester with the Florida Forest Service. Nathan, um, now we're here in this area. This is absolutely gorgeous. I, I'm telling you, I can't think of a more beautiful place to be out filming than this area here. What do you call this place? So this is cutthroat wet flatwoods. This is a uh, specific type of wet flatwoods area that has what you are standing in right now, cutthroat grass. Um, and it is a globally endangered ecosystem. So I shouldn't have just picked it. Is, is that what you're saying? It grows pretty, uh, <laughs> pretty thick in here because we burn it. No, it's, so neat. It's, a, it's, it's neat because it's kind of hard and it's not like a soft flowy grass that you would think. It's, it's almost like dry hay is what it feels right like. Right now it is because yeah. it's dry out. Um, these areas actually, they're called wet flatwoods for a reason. Mm -hmm. They do get uh, wet. Uh, they're seasonally inundated. Well, and that's what I'm feeling. We just had a, had a couple rains and I feel a little bit it feels firm, but a little bit mushy on top. So it dries out and soaks up a lot. Is so that what you're saying? Right here in the summertime, uh, we get a lot of rain and these areas will actually pool up water. Almost like a swamp, a marsh. Now, being a forester, um, what does that entail? I mean, obviously you're going to deal with the forest, but what do you do? Um, I do a lot of different things actually. My two main functions are forest inventory and then timber sales. Uh, forest inventory is basically knowing what trees are out here, what species they are, um, how tall they are, how big they are, what kind of health they're in. Now when you say about the species, 
like what are you dealing with? How many how many different types of trees are there? There's tons of different types of trees here, um, but for the most part, I'm dealing with pines. So our main pines are slash pine, longleaf pine, as well as sand pine in the scrubby areas. Okay. And then what are we looking at with, here? What are what are these in the background mostly? So these are these are slash pine. These are okay. actually South Florida slash pine. And they're easily identified by their height or their needles or what what makes them unique? So they're basically a commercial tree. They're very tall. They can get very tall. Okay. Um, they grow pretty decent diameter, uh, longer needles, but not quite long leaf uh, in length. So they, they grow fast. Longer. They're tall and fast. Is that? Fairly quickly. Yeah. I mean, compared to sand pine, not as quickly, but. So when, you, uh, when you're going around and you're identifying the species, why, why do you have to identify them? I mean, they're here. So what's, what's the purpose? Well, for one, different species are adapted to different types of sites. Um, you're going to get more sand pine on scrubby sites. Obviously, your slash pine here are in more wet sites. Mm. Uh, they do vary. Slash pine is actually pretty generalist. Uh, they'll grow in a lot of different places. What do you do when you catalog a tree? Okay, so actually, yes, I do take into consideration whether it has signs of uh, beetles or insects mm -hmm. on it, um, as well as different fungal infections or anything else that may be uh, harming the tree, stressing the tree out. Um, I deal with the size, so I measure the size of the tree, uh, measure the diameter of the tree, and then I also measure the height of the tree. So you climb up to the top and drop a line? And... <laughs> no. Um, I actually have a tool that is uh, called a clinometer. It's actually designed to uh, measure the, the height of a okay. tree. Well, that makes sense. It would be a lot of climbing. Yeah, it would, it would take a lot of time <laughs> if I had to do that. Now, you mentioned um, not only do you do the cataloging, you come out here and you, you know, take care of the trees, but we talked to Corey and, um, and Candace about the burns and how effective the burns are, does that help maintain the trees as well? It does. Um, because of the competition control that it does, it'll knock down some of the underbrush and some of the oaks that otherwise would actually uh, compete with our pine trees mm -hmm. and cause them to grow more slowly and possibly shade them out. Uh, it would also affect our regeneration, the new trees coming up. Uh, we log these areas and we want them to, to drop cones and, and seed out and have new trees coming up. Um, if we had too many oak trees or too much vegetation that wasn't low to the ground, then we wouldn't get any regeneration. Yeah. With the trees, does it, does the burning, like do you have a certain, like can it burn so far up on the tree and not harm it? Or do you have to keep the flames a certain distance? Like what, is there a we Vertical. try to keep the flames as low as possible, uh, but as long as it does not burn the very top, the terminal bud of the tree. The terminal you, bud. What the is terminal the terminal bud? bud? It's the very, very top of the tree. It's the, it's the bud that controls vertical growth. Okay. If it doesn't burn that, the tree will survive. So if you're likely. trimming a tree, don't trim the very top of the tree. You'll kill it. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's, that's one thing. Um, <laughs> if, you, if you do cut the terminal bud off, it will most likely kill, kill the tree, especially with pines. Um, but we try to keep the flame lengths uh, low. Right. We try to keep them, keep it low to the ground. And well, that's typically intense. what we see when you're driving past the road. You see everything on the ground is burned, and maybe the tree is only burned four or five feet up, up the trunk of the tree. And these trees are adapted. They have thick bark. They, mm -hmm. They're adapted to fire. Uh, about the bark, how do you, um, you know, are there special things that you do to to look at the bark and, and see how healthy the tree is? So bark isn't really a great indicator of health. Um, one of the things that we do, uh, the only measurement we take on bark is actually for product. Um, so we have to oh, know. Oh, so like mulch or something like that? Or what? More how much of the diameter of a tree is actually wood and some of it and oh, how much okay, of it is gotcha. bark. So, so, we'll so take this, a bark would be for, this would be for your lumber your lumber side of it then? Yes. Okay. How do you measure the thickness of the bark? So we have a little uh, tool that we put against the tree and basically you hit it and then it has a scale on the side you can cool. measure. Is that uh, what you got in your pocket? I actually have a bark cage here. Nice. So that goes against the tree and you just pop this. You and want to show me? pushes into the tree. I can. All right, let's, let's take a look at one of these. All right, Nathan, what do you think of, uh, what do you think of this one here? Is that a good one to test? Sure. Um, the first thing I'm 
I'm, I always do is measure the diameter of uh, this tree and these are graduated to be uh, to basically count the diameter of a tree so I'm gonna wrap it around the circumference of the tree but okay. it's gonna tell me how wide this tree is all right great they're just graduated like that so we measure this at tree hugger did you see that yeah that's trees. that is basically what I do <laughs> so 13.5 Get it straight here. Yeah, 13.4. There it goes. 13.4. So that's, that's the diameter. 13.4 of that. what? Inches. What is it? Inches? Yes. Okay. Well, so that's that a 13.4 seems... inch you know, diameter tree. Oh, so if you were to measure straight across. If I was okay. to measure straight across, that would be the diameter of I the tree. I got you. And then the other one of the other tools I'll use here is actually a bark gauge. So basically, you put it up against here and yeah, hit it. Do you carry a hammer with you so you don't hurt your hand? I don't do this on all the all the trees that I do. I do this on right. a, a, a subset of them. Oh, okay. And so... So in in, in the same area, you're going to get roughly the same reading of bark from the trees? Yes. Is that what you're saying? So that's a little over a half inch. Oh, it's got a little... Yeah, it's got a, a okay. little uh, measurement on it. And then you just pull it out. So it's got pretty thick bark. This is actually yeah. a, a pretty, pretty good tree. So... This is how you gauge the bark. You were saying about the height. I made a little joke about climbing, but you have some special tool that helps you measure how high up these things go. Yes, I do. It's and called a clinometer. A and clinometer. It is. I have one right here. And how does this thing work? It works based on trigonometry. So I go out to a specific distance. Uh, this is going to be 66 feet. Um, it has two sides on it, one that I can go to any distance. And 66 then I can feet from the tree? From the tree. Okay. And then I measure, um, it has numbers on it. It'll give me a number at the top, a number at the bottom. I add them. And, and it's the like using some type of level system or something within it yeah, that so it, tells it, you it what... It uses a... Oh yeah, okay. It's a little dial. Very cool. So, and I am going to go to 66 feet. All right. These things go straight up in the air, don't they? So how accurate was your stepping there? I mean, I guess you don't have to be perfect with 66 feet then. Um, Although you I would do usually this a lot. use I would usually use a logger's tape, which would I would put into the tree and then pull to okay. 66 feet. However, for illustration as a forester, yeah. I'm actually trained to pace. Yes, yeah, so you so know 66. I feet. know what 66 feet looks like, and I know what my pacing is. So we're at 66 feet. All right, so you're going to take that thing, put it right up to your eye then? Yep, and I'm going to put it right here and measure that. All right, so five at the bottom. And there you go. That's All right, it. So, That's a 50 so feet how, tall tree. 55 feet tall. Or 50, so. 50 foot tall. 50. 50. Yeah, 50 just foot. 50. Okay. Um, and then, let's see, bottom of the crown is at 25 feet, which... Roughly gives it a 50%. No, you say machine. bottom bottom of the crown. That's the first limb. That's first up there? limb, basically. Okay. Um, so it gives it roughly a 40 to 50%. That's crown neat. So you have to go through and do this with, you know, anytime you're planning to to send these trees out for lumber. Then. Yes. Um, crown ratio has a uh, big impact on what type of products as well as that's the health where of the, the tree. That's where the knots will start. Kind of yes. each, each limb creates a knot in the wood or whatever. Yep. Uh, and also, uh, trees with you know bigger, healthier-looking crowns, they're going to be healthier trees. Oh, okay. If you have one of these trees out here that has looks like it has a little tiny crown up top, it's probably uh, not healthy. Weak. Or... Let me see. Now, one of the things that I've noticed out here is you know these, this area is just so beautiful. I mean, it's it's gorgeous, and seeing this stuff on camera probably doesn't do people much justice there are lots of opportunities for people to get out into these areas and see it for themselves, aren't, isn't there? Yes, absolutely. We have a bunch of recreation opportunities and uh, I guess we can go back to Cory Walk and he'll talk about those for you. Cool, let's go find him. Alrighty. Now, Cory, you were saying like the, this is part of the flatwoods here. This is what we call, you call the flatwoods. Um, is that similar where we were just at with with Nathan? 
the yes. same kind of same kind of ecosystem. Yes, uh, the wet flatwoods, uh, cutthroat flatwoods are surrounding this marsh lake here uh, at Lake Godwin, and a lot of these areas around the lake were heavily dense uh, pine flatwoods, and we have done uh, multiple uh, over the last 10 years um, timber sale harvests to reduce the density and get it to about 10 to 50 trees per acre mm. to a more natural uh, desired future condition of these communities here around, around this area. It's funny to think of, of such a beautiful place and so many people don't don't take the time to experience it, don't don't take the time to get out. These places are open and available for people to visit, isn't it? Yes, uh, we have multiple op recreational opportunities on the state forest. We have hiking, bird watching, horseback riding, um, camping facilities available. We have uh, on the Arbuckle Track, we have five primitive campsites along Florida Trail and hiking trails, uh, as well as uh, also another opportunity at our Reedy Creek Campground, um, which is also on Arbuckle. Okay. And that's eight campsites available for primitive camping. And that's, as just, well. that's just right here in, right in this Arbuckle. forest. Right. Then we also have another track on Walking Water, it's north of here, mm -hmm. that has 10 campsites and also two more are over there. Uh, primitive campsites along another trail up on that side too. So, so you know, I've talked to the I've talked to the three of you today, but there's there's more folks that are involved with managing such a huge, vast uh, space of land. Um, how many people does it take to to run a to run a ship like this? Um, we have our resource staff, which are included, as I just said. We also right. have uh, three other personnel service services technicians mm -hmm. that treat invasives on the state forest which target non-native plant species or tree species that exist on the state forest where we go out and eradicate or kill those species through herbicide as well as locating them and and finding them within these ecosystems that exist here right. to minimize the spread as well as minimize the the overall health of the ecosystem with those species within the forest. So mm -hmm. that's what other staff exist here as well for managing these ecosystems. The other one is um, the fire uh, staff that we have on the state forest. We have one forest area supervisor and we have uh, five rangers stationed here as well to help us do the prescribed burning. Yeah. Now, are there opportunities for people to team up with the Florida Forest Service, like cleanup days or things like that, where people can get involved and help volunteer? We have a volunteer program, and um, people are welcome through that as well. Um, through our website, they can go right on our website and apply. Um, they can call our local state forest office or district office and get applications and, and contact myself. Uh, or our field staff here at the State Forest for opportunities to help here on the Lake Wells Ridge State Forest. And yeah. the website is a good place for people to go to find, you know, uh, park entrances and trails and things like that? They can call our office. Uh, we also have kiosks located on the State Forest to have maps and brochures, handout materials that people can get, as well as our also a great up, uh, reference as well as our staff assistant at our State Forest office that also helps collect with the, the questions uh, where stuff at, we can provide over the phone as well uh, information. So a contact person is there also at our state forest office. Yeah. Well, Corey, thank you so much for all that you do. It's always a great day when we get to come out here and enjoy all this beautiful land. Thanks for coming. Listen, if you're, if you're looking for something to do, you have to get out here and enjoy some of uh, Florida's beautiful state forest. Uh, this stuff is wonderfully preserved and so peaceful and quiet and listen if it's a rainy day and you don't want to go outside you can always stick around and join me when we seek out yet another science quest